Good afternoon. Good morning, everybody, wherever you may be. Uh, welcome to uh, TNFD's <clears throat> uh, webinar on nature-related futures and how scenarios are working through for the latest TNFD um, recommended guidance that's coming out. I'm David Croft from Reckitt, uh, one of the TNFD task force members, and uh, I'm looking forward to a good conversation today. Um, just before I introduce the panelists for today, just a bit of housekeeping for you. Please uh, put Zoom into speaker view for the best experience. Hopefully that helps everybody. Uh, this session is being recorded um, and we'll pop it up on YouTube afterwards. Um, so if you've got any questions or concerns about that, do flag, uh, but be aware it is being recorded and we'll move it forward. And if you've got questions as we go through uh, the conversation over the next 45 minutes or so. Pop them into the Q&A uh, and we'll monitor those as they come through. Um, upvote any that you'd like specifically to see answered and, and follow up on, uh, but we'll do our best to get through to all of those questions as much as time allows. There are now 170 of us, so it's obviously a very popular and topical outcome, out, out, uh, area of outcome that we're going to try and generate. Um, from my point of view, the scenario conversation has been one of the, the most interesting and I think perhaps most eagerly awaited parts of the TNFD conversation, because it really does start to play through from bringing leap to life and starts to give us all excellent areas um, <clears throat> to think through how um, the nature-related financial areas of our value chains and businesses will be taken forward and how we uh, target some of that activity um, in the most effective way to create impact, impact for the business and impact through the business that we're all part of. And in doing so, think about how we strengthen nature, build resilience, but also go further than that, uh, depending on the significance, especially that the scenarios help in terms of framing the conversation about where you're working, how you're working, what you're doing, and so on and so forth. Um, we've got two great contributors to the panel today, uh, Carrie Hausman from Dow, and Carrie is Dow's Global Sustainability Director. She's responsible for all of their work on water and biodiversity, as well as uh, supporting a, an incredible amount of work on the company's carbon strategy. And Carrie's been at Dow for um, 25 years, although she probably doesn't want me to say it in those words. Sorry, Carrie. Um, and has had a range of roles in that time. Uh, ranging from Director of Public Policy and Issues and heading up Dow's Enterprise Issues Management Team. So welcome to Carrie. Um, and having worked with her on one of the um, specific work streams, um, I've seen the work that they're doing at Dow and that we're sharing uh, with our own, in, own input from Reckitt. And, it, and it's, uh, I think you'll get an awful lot of insight from Carrie's uh, presentation coming up in a moment. Our second panelist today is Steve Weber. Steve is a partner of Breakwater Strategy um, that has been working very closely with TNFD on the whole of the scenario work. Um, I was fortunate enough to work with Steve on it when we when we piloted it with, with Reckitt um, a few months ago to see how it played through. Um, in his quiet time, he's also a professor of the Graduate School, uh, the School of Information Department of Political Science at UC Berkeley, um, which makes him one of the world's uh, most expert practitioners of scenario planning. He's worked with more than 50 companies and organizations to develop this discipline as a strategy planning tool in both the for-profit and in the not-for-profit and government sectors. Um, so lots of great experience that you'll hear from today. Um, Steve's going to kick us off uh, with about a 10-minute conversation about TNFD scenarios approach. There are some slides uh, that we'll project and talk through. And then Carrie's going to pick up the conversation and give you some of the insights from how Dow have worked through their own biodiversity strategy and how that is playing through in terms of engagement with TNFD, the scenarios and the lessons learned from that. I'm sure there will be lots of questions. So do start to um, feed them in to the Q&A um, and we will pick them up as we go through. On that note, Steve, if you're good to go, I will hand over to you and look forward to seeing the questions that pop up. Steve, over to you. 
Great. Thank you, David. And thanks, everybody, for turning up this morning to hear some of our uh, early thoughts on our approach to grappling with scenarios in the context of TNFD. Uh, really a great uh, honor to be able to be involved in this work. So I'm just going to spend a few minutes trying to explain some of the decisions we made uh, and some of the approaches that we're taking and then turn it over to Carrie to talk about how it worked uh, for her and her team at Dow. So let's go to the first slide. I, I think the important element of owning a scenario piece to this puzzle is really about um, focusing on both the challenges and the opportunities of trying to build a scientifically robust analysis for nature and explain some of the choices that we made in doing that, being cognizant of the fact that there is a great deal of uncertainty in the science, in the policy, in the actual ecologies that we're trying to influence and, and promote, and in the choice set that business strategists face when they grapple with all of those ingredients in the context of normal business practice. And I think one of the first things you have to do um, to get this right or to get this going in the right direction is simply to get some terminology really crisp and precise. So I think of that as like, what is a scenario and how do scenarios fit into this story? Uh, many of us, when we do business planning, uh, do sensitivity analysis. Many of us do stress tests. Many of us do scenarios. They're really three different things, and they serve three different purposes. So I just want to make sure everybody's really clear about that. Um, I think of sensitivity analysis as taking a kind of a planning model, um, which is usually articulated as a case, and then asking yourself, how does it change when inputs vary within some kind of expected ranges? And most forecasters do this. Um, this can take account of variation in important nature inputs, uh, but it tends to kind of develop uh, into models that have like a best case, worst case, or a medium case scenario, like plus 10%, minus 10%, not really fundamentally different models, the same model tested within a range. People often also do stress tests, which we often think of as representing kind of edge cases. So if you take an extreme value of a rare relevant variable, let's say in this case, a nature input variable that might um, move to an extreme and even unexpected value, what happens to the model? How does it degrade? How does it change? How can you make your performance more robust in that context? Scenarios are really trying to do something slightly different. Scenarios are trying to account for what on Wall Street people might call these days model risk which is in some sense, a kind of broader set of uncertainties that are relevant to decision-making, some of which represent really profound discontinuities with existing planning models. In other words, not just plus 10%, minus 10%, but something really different, which represents almost a different model in and of itself. And this isn't a kind of a either or choice um, between sensitivity analysis, stress tests and scenarios. It's actually all three that probably need to be done to effectively plan in an environment like this. So we're gonna talk about this scenario piece in particular. Let's go to the next slide. The first decision that we had to make um, on that next slide, when we look at the way in which um, to configure scenarios for nature was, where do we start? In terms of the kinds of institutions or the level of sophistication and size of organizations, for which we wanted to produce a scenario product that would be usable actually in practice and not just kind of theoretically interesting. And for a bunch of different reasons, which uh, we might talk about in question and answer if people want to, um, we chose to start um, the analysis at the level of what we call here medium to large scale subnational businesses, rather than sort of the very local business or at the top of the stack, um, a macro prudential approach. Couple of reasons for that. One reason is because we thought at that level of business decision making, we could actually develop scenarios that would be most relevant and most impactful on strategic decisions in a more granular way to take account of some of the local variation that we know nature assets exhibit, um, both in the natural environment and in how they fit into business planning. And second, very practically, because there are other groups and other organizations doing work at other levels of this stack. And so we, again, we thought the most important contribution could be made where 
contributions were not currently being generated and that they could be integrated with work doing elsewhere and being done elsewhere. So that was one of the important um, decisions we made very early on, and that really affects the design of the scenarios that we've built for this process. So let's go on to the next slide. All modeling exercises involve a bunch of trade-offs. And that's true of scenario modeling, whether it be quantitative or qualitative, doesn't really matter. All modeling exercises involve a bunch of trade-offs. And I just want to address um, some of the trade-offs that we made here that I think are most important to understanding the output and the UA in which these scenarios can be used. Probably the most important of all is that first bullet, which addresses what we call normative versus analytic scenarios. This is really important to, 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 to keep in mind. Normative scenarios are usually designed with a specific desired goal in mind. For example, we want to build a business that is nature positive. And then we ask ourselves on a variety of different landscapes, how would we best achieve that goal? And it, it, this is sort of the way in which we kind of typically think about climate scenarios. We want to limit to 1.5 degrees centigrade, what are the various ways in which we can do that? Analytic scenarios don't take that normative goal out of the equation. They just deal with it in a different way. They start from the perspective that there is a business landscape on which you have to operate that you actually don't have control over and perhaps um, don't really have insight into exactly how it's going to evolve. And in order to kind of pursue a normative goal, the desire to be able to see that landscape in its fullest set of possibilities is what the scenarios are designed to do. Sometimes people refer to this um, in the climate world as policy-centric versus policy-contextual scenarios. In other words, we don't assume in an analytic scenario exercises we've done here any particular policy outcome we're trying to create a landscape in which one can see a variety of policy and nature asset outcomes and use that to prompt the building of a strategy that can work no matter what part of that landscape you land on. So that's the really first important trade-off. The second most important trade-off that I would just name before we move on is the issue around complexity and simplicity. The scenarios that TNFD built um, for this purpose are by intention, simple, rather than deeply complex. Um, we've decided to essentially build a simple framework and allow individual organizations, businesses, strategy teams, et cetera, to kind of layer the complexity of their individual situations back into a simple framework. And we've done that for the purpose of making the scenarios more usable, hopefully, but also more comparable across cases. Let's go on to the next slide. And we've done that, um, as I said, with all as with all modeling exercises, um, in the uh, intention or the plan that the simplification of the model becomes a kind of a, a, a lattice or a scaffold on which other complexities can be reorganized. The simplest way to do that in many scenario analyses is to try to focus attention on not three, not four, not five, but two critical uncertainties. In other words, drivers of the nature relevant business environment, which have the most potential and most relevant variance within them. Things that for decision makers are both highly uncertain and also very important at the same time. This is kind of a classic um, way in which to build scenarios. And it often ends up looking on the next slide, as you see on the next slide, like a two by two matrix. And again, um, just a simplification, just an artifact in order to uh, discipline thinking. But let me just address really quickly the two critical uncertainties that show up on this matrix. Um, I won't go into the process by which we develop them now. We can talk about that more in question and answer if people like. Um, but you'll see on the x-axis a kind of an assessment um, that a firm could make because presumably it has best access to the data it would need to make this assessment of the actual ecosystem degradation that it is experiencing relative to what it wants to achieve. This is um, 
sort of similar in many ways to what is traditionally called physical risk, but it focuses here directly on exactly what kind of ecosystem service degradations are being experienced by the firm at the time at which it's doing this analysis and over the time horizon in which it believes that analysis ought to be robust. On the y-axis, you'll see an assessment of coherence and alignment of market and non-market forces, which could either be, um, on the one hand, uh, highly coherent and aligned and pointing in the same direction, or at the other extreme, actually um, quite unaligned, conflicting, and actually providing lots of kind of differentiated and um, inconsistent signals um, which would usually be thought to be or seen as a more um, complex and difficult decision-making environment. And you might look at this and say it, it is similar, and it is, to what we typically think of as, quote, transition risk. But what we're emphasizing here actually is the alignment of those signals or the incoherence of those signals as the most important factor in firm decision-making. And you can see that as we've done in our work, and it's available, of course, on the TNFD website, that this two by two matrix creates four different scenario worlds in which a firm would need to pursue its normatively desirable strategy. Let's go to the next slide. This is just a, uh, a way to visualize um, a set of questions, and obviously we're not going to go through them in any detail. Again, they're available on the TNFD website, but I wanted to highlight um, what the scenarios are used for. Here's a set of questions that a decision maker would pose to each of the four scenarios in which he or she might have to operate. And so it's a way of sort of understanding um, in a more disciplined way how the options, decisions, inputs, outputs change as one moves through the analysis um, of all four scenarios. And the idea here is for firms operating with this tool to pose essentially the same or very comparable questions to the tool, excuse me, to the landscape, so that over time, as a number of firms use a tool like this, their answers start to accumulate and become more comparable with each other. And that's one of the mechanisms we think will help um, these individual exercises aggregate to a more systemic view of how firm decision making will change in the context of nature stress. And so let me end with the last slide kind of summing up the way we think about this. The key objective of this exercise is to not to assume that firms can choose a de desired scenario. That's, that's, they mostly can't. It's actually to build strategies for nature positive outcomes that would be robust or would work regardless of where the world ends up on the scenario landscape to seize opportunities and manage risks on that landscape. Two last thoughts. I think one of the outcomes we're hoping for here is to help focus attention on what would otherwise be an almost infinite number of possible scientific modeling exercises when we're talking about the complexity of nature. So one of the questions we would hope firms would ask after doing this work is, having seen that landscape, where would we get the highest payoff from investing in new measurement, quantification, and scientific modeling efforts, knowing that with the complexity and the local complexity in particular of nature assets, we can't do everything. The second would be, how do we think about the logic of disclosure? What disclosures would the firm want and need investors to see in order to evaluate, evaluate its preferred outcomes and it, the decision-making and strategy that develops on the basis of this work? So as you can see, um, it's kind of a complex exercise of trying to break it down into sort of digestible chunks and piloted a, uh, a couple of these with a number of different firms. I want to turn it over to Carrie toss it over to Carrie to talk about um, what it looked like from the perspective of Dow. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Um, good morning, good afternoon to you all. Wanted to just to just quickly start by giving you a little bit of a sense of what Dow has done over the last number of years on biodiversity, because I think it um, there are a couple points here that I want to pull through when we talk about the lessons learned. 
um, from the scenario pilot that we did with Steve. So I think first and foremost, we started our real quite formal efforts on biodiversity about a decade ago when we put forward a valuing nature sustainability goal, um, which really was one goal in a third set of 10-year sustainability goals. So Dow has, has had three different sets of 10-year goals. Most of them were set without any real understanding or really any real knowledge about how we would actually achieve them. But we started out here by saying we needed to figure out a different way to value nature in our operations. And so this 10 to 15 year um, partnership with the Nature Conservancy has really advanced our thinking about the value of nature to our operations. And, and to that end, and to the, to, in order to deliver against this sustainability goal, we put together a tool with the Nature Conservancy called the EASY tool, E-S-I-I -I tool, which is publicly available now, which really allows a firm like, like Dow or probably any firm <clears throat> really to put an NPV on every project that you do that has benefits associated with nature-based solutions. And this was extremely important knowledge for our, for our company to, to really get a handle on First of all, how you do this. And second of all, really the, the base business case for moving forward with meaningful thinking around biodiversity and the value of nature to operations and the dependency of our operations on nature. And so I think it's it's fair to say here that we're really looking at TNFD as an important set of guideposts to inform a new water and biodiversity strategy that I'm working on right now. We'll roll that out in a few months. But TNFD, um, I, I think, has really provided a lot of the, the engagement with, with the Secretariat and with the team so far has really provided us a really important, um, a really important different kind of view, not only valuing nature to the operations, but the value of these projects to nature and biodiversity themselves. Um, Dow's engagement with TNFD, just real briefly here, I will say that, that Dow is a TNFD task force member and that we're currently leading the chemical pharma biotech working group to put together sector specific guidance. Um, and that, that's been, again, a tremendous learning and opportunity for us to get engaged. We piloted um, a couple of the beta versions of the framework, but most recently, obviously, piloted the scenario analysis me methodology with the help of the TNFD team. So just a few, just a few points about how we approach the pilot with, um, with Tony and Steve's input and, and guidance. First of all, we were, we were fortunate in the sense that we were able to do this in person with the team. So Steve and Tony both came to our Freeport, Texas site in March in order to pilot this, this methodology. Um, I will be quite candid here. I had no idea really what to expect and really know how this was going to go, but we, um, we took a bit of a leap of faith here, and we scheduled a five-hour, roughly, workshop that TNFD and, and Breakwater Steve can um, facilitate it for us. We brought together, in order to do this, about 20 different subject matter experts across the company to participate in the workshop. So we had expertise there, just to give you a sense, um, that ranged from legal and environmental reporting to regulatory affairs. Um, to site operations, manufacturing, government affairs, public affairs, investor relations. So, you know, at Steve and Tony's encouragement, we really took, took this with a view of the most robust kind of talent set around the table is probably going to give us the best feel for not only the learnings about the methodology, but about how we needed to think about actually doing the scenario analysis for the company at a, at a bit later date. And the kind of expertise that we want we want around that table. Um, so I, I just want to just want to note here we we piloted the methodology. We did not use this as a true scenario analysis. So we did not have top 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 level leadership involved in this scenario analysis. We looked at this from a methodology standpoint, not from a results to refine business strategy perspective at this point in the process. So some of the key questions that that we um, that we had to address and consistent with the, the worksheets and the tools that Steve showed is, first of all, where do we think Dow is in terms of impact and overall dependency on nature? So on that X, Y grid, where do we really think we currently were? And this uh, second, a second facet was the scale. So at what scale did we want to even run the exercise? Are we thinking about this at a site level? 
Dow has 105 sites worldwide. Did we think about this at a regional level and an enterprise level? Um, and so there was a lot of good conversation about how you really frame the scale at which you do not only the pilot test, but eventually that will inform the way we choose to do the scenario analysis itself. And then we had, a, a, I think, a, a very good, robust conversation about the key nature dependencies for the scale we chose. So we really needed to understand what were the key, what were the key dependencies that that site, that region, whatever, um, needed to address in order to really effectively run the scenario um, scenario pilot. So our team decided to approach it. It was kind of a hybrid manner, really. So we considered our largest U.S. asset in, in Freeport, Texas. And partly because it's our largest asset, partly because we have critical mass of subject matter expertise there, having decided to, to do the, the scenario analysis at the site, but partly because we understand that if something something disrupts operations at that particular site, it's meaningful to the company in a lot of different ways. So we really... Um, we really just took the approach of we're going to run the scenario analysis, we're going to run this pilot at the Freeport, Texas level, and we're going to we're going to think through as a group the impact of these scenarios on Dow's corporate strategy as a result of pressures on on that one particular site. And so for us, we noted that water was one of the key dependencies for this site. So we focused most of our conversation on the impact of water scarcity on the site's ability to operate, and then we talked a lot about the 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 failure of the site to to operate on Dow's overall performance. So, really, what relative what relative impact did it have on Dow's um, Dow's continuity? So, we broke into four groups. Each group had a scenario to focus on, just for time, just for the sake of time, in order to move the exercise along in the in the five hours that we had. And we evaluated we evaluated our reality against a list of attributes associated with that particular world or scenario that that Steve and Tony laid out for us. And from there, we really categorized the likelihood and severity of the attributes against Dow's strategy, highlighting for us where we may need to think about some different, different kinds of strategies or strategic shifts in the event that we start to see flags that we're heading towards that, that new reality. Um, and, and I will say here, you know, the, the, the tools that the TNFD and that Steve brought were, were really very helpful. That worksheet looking tool that he pulled up in, as part of his slides they were very helpful to keep the individual breakout groups organized. And so I, you know, I don't, I don't know if that's necessarily the work, the worksheet that you take to use with executive leadership when you're ready to do the scenario pilot, but something, if not that, something very close, I think you'll find will, will be, um, be very instructive and, and be very, um, be very critical to keeping the, keeping the conversation and keeping the, keeping the process rolling in, in the direction that you need it to. Um, so what did we learn? So we'll talk a little bit about, um, next slide please, talk a little bit about Dow's key learnings as part of the, of the collaboration um, and this, this scenario workshop. I would say first and foremost, that TNFD and breakwater strategies were very effective collaborators for us. They were, they were very skilled facilitators, very open to the team's feedback. They put together a very, um, a very open and very collegial and cordial environment for us to kind of learn and ask questions and and provide a level of of candor and and maybe pressure testing their direction that I, I think some of our participants were a bit surprised that they were as open as they were to the feedback and the questions and the challenges that that we were wrestling and that that kind of came up uh, through the pilot. Um, I, I think that really signals their willingness to to support industry's needs and and a practical nature to create a, a very usable and efficient framework for us. Um, we the second learning is is that the, that diversity of expertise that we assembled around the table I think was really critical to us getting out of it from a company perspective. What we really needed to to have a sense of what this would take at a at, a, at an executive leadership level to, to really pull off and to do this meaningfully and well. So consider if you're if you're pulling together either a pilot or your for real, I say for real um, scenario analysis, really, really 
focus on on a diverse participant group, I think it will be key to your success and key to the to really making that analysis meaningful for your company. Um, and I will say that because of the because of the diversity and because of the resource the resource burden, frankly, that this can pose on an organization, the business case to do this is critical. And companies really need to be clear eyed about how much time and resources this disclosure framework and the scenario analysis that's part of it will will actually require. Um, need to be real about the dependencies on nature based services, their impact on ecosystems around your operations. You need to be real about what this means for supply chains, from for your products, for your business strategy in general. And you know, when we when we took a look at this, we said, well, when we we thought about materiality from an operations perspective, the most critical lens for us, and I think probably for most companies, is really business continuity, and what it's going to take in order for what what kind of interaction between the company and nature is going to be necessary in order for you to maintain business continuity. And I think I would just say here from personal learning and company learning over the last decade or so that the time necessary to really shift a company culture towards more of a mindfulness about nature, you shouldn't, you shouldn't underestimate it. It's taken us almost a decade so far and counting, I would, I would note. So while we've made huge strides, there still are significant pockets of the organization at, at, where this really is not a, a key consideration still. Scale is important. Determining whether you do this at a site level, a regional level, or an enterprise level, the boundary conditions really is going to be key for you to set up the exercise efficiently and effectively. Um, and, and it will also determine the extent to which that scenario analysis can actually inform go forward business strategy and mitigate nature related risk. Um, I would say for us that one of the big ahas is that the integration with your with your company's existing risk framework should be considered before you do this for real. So what do I mean by that? When you when you integrate this with, for example, a corporate enterprise risk management process, or a scenario analysis for another disclosure framework, um, you know, ideally because this is not a checkbox activity, this informs company strategy should have a good sense of where this where this input output actually um, fits in with your existing risk management structure. And, and so that was really a meaningful part of the conversation for us is to, gosh, there is some homework that I need to do here before we jump in as an organization and do this scenario analysis. And this is one of the, one of the really key elements of it. Um, I will say here, and you know, Tony and Steve and I have talked about this on a couple of different occasions that the need to replicate and the need to um, the need to manage the scale, but also manage the replication of this in supply chain and in downstream value chain is very significant. Um, whether you have multiple operation sites, you know, like some manufacturers have thousands of suppliers, tens of thousands of products, for example, it's really to everyone's benefit to try and to try and to the extent possible standardize on some prioritization frameworks or criteria that will allow everyone to meaningfully disclose while managing sheer number of, of inputs that you'll have to this kind of an assessment. And I would say here, just the last, my last point that I wanted to raise is, is just, just a note that a disclosure framework like TNFD, TCFD, all of these other disclosure frameworks, they don't represent a strategy necessarily. Um, and so I would say that while they provide, and for us, they will provide meaningful guardrails, guideposts, to signal some external stakeholder priorities, the true north for your company and keeping that first in mind is gonna be very important for your firm. Um, be clear-eyed about what it takes to mitigate risk, what is material to your company, what is meaningful from a continuity, business continuity standpoint. And I think that that will, that will help keep, keep a, a, you know, a, a new and existing or a refreshed biodiversity and nature strategy much closer to the heart of your company is if you really allow the company to be the true north rather than a disclosure framework itself. Um, and, and that, you know, like I said, that really goes back to a, a, a clear eyed view of business continuity and the other externalities that you determine are most important um, and, a, and a real understanding about what it takes to, to start to move 
a company culture in this direction. So um, Steve, David, I will leave it there and we'll see what if, what if any are questions that are popping up. Uh, thank you, Kami. Uh, Steve, thanks for coming back on camera. Um, so we have a number of questions. Just as I get to those, I mean, uh, let me just reflect from, from my point of view. Um, when we went through the, the scenario exercise that Carrie's just um, described from Dow's perspective, um, uh, from my point of view, I think I would say very similar learnings. I, I, it's, it's the scenario, the four quadrants have, have evolved in their description since that time. And that's been, that's been quite helpful. Um, those of you who may have seen an earlier draft, they were quite um, narrative driven in some of the descriptions, I think, Steve. And now we've got to what feels much more like, uh, as you were saying, Carrie, something that's blended in to an overall, an overarching enterprise risk management approach, which I think from a corporate perspective does help that alignment into that core risk management agenda um, that, that's that helps get that narrative and the right connectivity between different functions inside a large organization working well together. Um, we know from you know change management conversations, and Steve's way better at versed at this than I am, that you know, as soon as you start using a different set of language, even though you might still try to be talking about the same things, people just get slightly confused by it. And it's like, is this something new? How do I adapt to that? Where do I put that in? Well, the reality is here, there are very similar approaches to what we already see in TCFD or on that wider enterprise wide risk assessment and risk management approach that businesses have as a whole. Um, I think uh, Harry's comments about, you know, at what scope do you give this on a site level, on a value chain level, on a particular ingredients value chain? And that was something that we thought a lot about from a record point of view, about how it works, particularly upstream around that, which is our most obvious point of connection. That's something to think through as well as you work this through. I mean, at its at, at the end level, it has to be total organization. But beginning with key value chains, key locations, I think is a helpful way of um, exploding the conversation um, to uh, to get to the level of detail that Carrie was talking about, because it does have detail. It has to have detail that sits behind it. The leap approach has detail that sits behind it. It's location specific. You need to understand the pros and cons, and and also the you know where your interventions can create that uh, that move towards nature positive. And if you start off too wide, it's very difficult to land those conversations. I think so. That that will be my build on what you've heard from from Carrie and Steve. Now we've got a host of great questions, which is good to see, which makes my life as moderator that little bit easier. So thank you for that. Um, I'm not going to pick these in, in particular order, but I'm going to sort of start off, um, Steve, with some of the some of the points that have been made and raised about um, the scenario quadrants, first of all. Um, so the first question I want to start is when it comes to the flexibility of the quadrants, would you welcome different axes or a more granular breakdown of the coordinate system? Um, maybe thinking about a scale of one to ten on the two axes. Now, I seem to remember for my call, they are already broken down into this to give you that um, relativity, if you like. But what, what's your, how would you answer that, Steve? Well, uh, yeah, thanks, David. Obviously, uh, a tool is only as good as its use in the hands of those who choose to use it. So people should use it in the way they think best. I think from the perspective of um, TNFD as a organization that wants to be able to aggregate the learnings across organizations. Um, I think we would hope that the axes as they are currently configured are general and applicable enough to different organizations that people could experiment with using them roughly as they are. In other words, customized to the particular kinds of applications and issues that your firm needs, but try to stay within the framework so that you don't end up with a kind of, you know, a, a, a kind of a list of different scenario projects that are being done across many, many different firms that ultimately make it very, very hard to compare results and to aggregate the insights from them upwards towards the higher levels that we want to be able to get to. Um, that said, I think that obviously um, this notion of like 
uh, and, and Carrie hit it, I think, very, very well. Where are we now on these? And why do we know or why do we believe we are at a particular point on each of these variables right now um, is a very important conversation. And it may be that firms will have to kind of set up those metrics or we'll call it zero to 10 in different ways. Um, making those decisions and those kind of um, kind of call them exercises in getting the right metrics on those axes visible to the extent that they can be made visible to others is a really, really important contribution to the TNFD effort overall, I think. And that, I think, sort of brings in a point about, uh, as you say there, Steve, about relativity. And Carrie, you mentioned you had a, a broad group of people into it. Um, there's, there's another question that talks about how that team, how that collective approach builds together. What's the role of the financial team versus the sustainability team in this conversation, would you say, in the scenario planning? Um, Carrie, do you want to say how they fed, how, did they fed into yours? And, and then, Steve, do you want to respond on that as well? Yeah, I would say for us, the, the investor relations team in particular provided some interesting feedback and, and interesting input about the question of what really is the risk and what is the what is the response of the go forward corporate strategy based on, um, you know, based on a disruption in operations, for example. So they, they, they do they do provide that sense of of really the impact to the company, but they also provide an outside in view of what what is expected from a shareholder, um, you know, investor view. What really are our investors and our owners looking for the company to do and how what would be an acceptable response in the event that we did see flags of, of a particular scenario developing? So I think it's important to have them at the table, you know, not not least of which is the dollars and cents piece to the extent that the group wants to go down that view. But they also do bring an important stakeholder representation, a different different stakeholder group than than many of us in sustainability or than some of us in operations may impact um, or, or encounter in, in our normal day-to-day. -day. And, and Steve, what, what do you think the input from a, a financial team's perspective could be to the scenarios? How, and, and is that sort of linked to that dependency element you were touching on when you were speaking yeah. earlier? Yeah, first of all, I would just, just double down on everything Carrie just said um, and add one additional element to it, which is that I think um, from an investor relations perspective, the question, I, I mean, in some sense, you want an IR person in that setting to be made a little bit uncomfortable in the sense of saying, I'm not just inputting to the conversation, here's what I think the investor community uh, wants uh, in a risk landscape like this, but um, the discomfort of being, how am I going to explain to my investors what we're doing here and what choices we've made against that risk landscape? That ought to be slightly discomforting, um, but it's actually, you know, part of the purpose of scenario analysis of this kind is to create that challenge in a safe environment where we can figure out if we had to actually explain to investors, this is the way we see the, the risk landscape here and here's what we're doing to mitigate it. How would we make that um, explanation compelling, understandable, and respectable from the perspective of investors? I think that's a, a very important part of the exercise. So I see the IR people as playing both of those roles, both as input and assessing how they would actually work with the output of an exercise, exercise like this. Yeah, I, I think that's, that, I think bringing in the voice of different stakeholders. Um, I think is a, is a really important part of the scenario analysis. And when when we did the same from a record point of view, we had people from supply chain, from procurement, from finance, from sustainability, stroke corporate affairs. So we're trying to think about all of the different stakeholders who we engage with. And that's um, the financial sector, the consumer sector, civil society, governmental, and so on and so forth. And that actually opens up a, a question um, that a couple of people have flagged, which is, um, you know, on, on the basis of how do the scenarios think about dependency on ecosystems and impact on nature, um, as well as um, the impact on the business, if you like that double materiality conversation that we've touched on more than once in the conversations at TNFD in the past. How would you how would you sort of answer that point, uh, Carrie, Steve, in terms of dependency on ecosystems or just dependency, if you like? 
I, you know, I guess we didn't, we didn't necessarily parse the difference. I don't know, Steve, jump in because, you know, you obviously were an important part of our pilot. We, we talked about dependencies of nature for the purposes of running through the, the methodology. Um, and for us in Freeport, it, it was water. That was one of the most significant potential constraints on operations there. So I don't know, Steve, I don't, I guess I don't know how, how to answer that further, Steve, except to say that the you know, our workshop was was limited in time and kind of you know, tried to keep it quite focused. So we didn't didn't wander too far from kind of the base case. Yeah, I guess I, I would say that no, I agree with that. And I, I guess I would say that in both the, 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 the distinction feels a little bit artificial to me in the context of the conversations we did. I mean, it's an interdependency. Um, a, a, a firm sitting in an ecosystem that's having an impact on the, the, the ecosystem is affecting the firm's operations, the firm op firm's operations are affecting the ecosystem. Um, they're interdependent and they're codependent on each other. And all we've tried to do really in the scenario analysis is to sketch out different ways in which that interdependency might manifest. So I think we've grappled with it by putting the two together in the same framework um, which I actually think is a kind of a realistic representation of the way businesses and, and ecosystems um, interface with each other in the real world. That may not be a fully adequate answer, but I, that's the way we tried to grapple with it. Yeah, I, 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 my, my take on it is, is fairly similar, Steve. And for me, when we look at any of the, the challenges that um, proverbially the SDGs face into as a whole, there's a blend of market actors and non-market actors that can be part of those solutions. And, and actually, if we don't um, try and find the ways of them complement each other, as opposed to overlapping each other, then our ability to, to tackle those issues in the greatest possible scale is going to be limited. And so for me, um, it is a case of saying, well, this is as a market actor what we can do, and that will respond in certain ways to many things. But there's also seeing that alongside non-market actors. And I think this is where TNFD's engagement with the emerging and very rapidly emerging mm -hmm. over recent times um, governmental policy positions is, is very positive. So it's not just um, a risk response. It's a risk response in the context of those global platforms and those global policy positions that continue to strengthen. And then you try and hopefully make the most of that market and non-market actor approach uh, rather than just answering it in silos. I think our failure to tackle many of these global challenges are, is at the heart based on the fact that things have been tackled in silos in the past. But let's not get too philosophical for a Monday morning or Monday afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. Um, let me go to the first question that was posed early on in the discussion. Um, and this, this when, when Steve and I went through the scenarios with one of my um, real questions that we were trying to think through, what does scope one, two, and three TNF do look like? And how does the scenario work help you to think that through? And that could be upstream as well as downstream, of course. And, and certainly within the, the value chain work, it, it's definitely identifying both. But Steve, what's your take on scope one, two, and three for TNFD? And I'm, I may, if Emily is on the call from TNFD, we may get your input to it as well, Emily, if you're there. But Steve, you want to have a go first? Boy, I certainly hope Emily is here because um, I wish I had a compelling answer to that question. Uh, I find uh, scope three emissions, uh, even in the carbon uh, world, uh, very, very hard to understand uh, and, and measure, obviously, I think as do many. Uh, I, I think honestly, to be totally transparent. Um, I believe that we have not really tried to distinguish those categories of conversation in this scenario work. Um, that might be a next iteration going a, a, as we move forward. Uh, I also think that in some ways, you know, the scope one, two, three thing is important for firms to measure, to try to measure it. It's obviously crucial or will probably become crucial to disclosure recommendations as well. But to be frank, we just haven't grappled with it here. We've tried to stay um, at a higher level of aggregation or a higher level of abstraction to not get bogged down in it. It's a terribly inadequate answer, but it's an honest one. No, I, I think look, I, I think we all know that this is an evolving um, set of guidance and activities. It will not be um, 
absolutely complete uh, the perfect answer come the end of September and uh, I think we know that from a TNFD task force that it's going to continue to evolve just as TCFD has continued to evolve and, and, and interestingly to your point Carrie market actors help it to evolve the investor community helps it to evolve because they look for more and more insight and detail mm -hmm. in some of that so um, you know far from being maybe the uh, the reason to do less the market act is increasingly it seems from a climate change perspective and the reason to do more because they're moving pretty quick on that position is, is my own experience and i can see you nodding and i think you've heard the same the same i think is going to be true for, for nature um that um that downstream piece i think is challenging um but where it is material what i'm seeing is people t bringing it through as part of their um impact evaluations um Carrie, somebody's um, pointed out or raised the fact that you know, many, many of Dow's activities are around plastics and, and they're going to be challenging from a nature positive perspective. That's a downstream conversation, particularly. How do you think about that downstream play? Yeah, I, I would say, you know, that, that this is that this is really um, a conversation more about weighing pros and cons of, of products, product uses, downstream uses than it is about having the having the ability or, or frankly, even maybe the luxury of saying it is nature positive. It is not nature positive because, you know, you think about think about this in terms of of plastics. You know, I, obviously there's there's no there's no getting around plastics for Dow. Um, but to say that, to, for example, to, there are trade-offs here. To say that the that the that the economy that society gets to carbon neutrality by 2050 without plastics is simply a fallacy. Life cycle assessment shows that's not possible. There there are practical realities that show that that's not possible. So I, I think that this becomes a conversation really about mitigating risk, understanding where your risk is, mitigating risk. And, and I will say for the last many, many years at, at the company, for example, addressing plastic in the environment for us, and I know, you know, agrochemicals for other companies who still produce them, is a part of the business strategy. We don't separate any more sustainability from business strategy. And so the mitigation of downstream impacts has been has been considered and assessed and evaluated over decades on the chemical side of, of the equation. REACH dossiers, for example, ad address exposure assessments, risk assessments. Um, what, what's new here is, is really the impact on nature itself and, a, and a, an opening of the envelope or an opening of the lens through which we need to start evaluating or continue or extend evaluations of the products that we produce. So I think it's gonna be a challenge. I, I'll be very transparent here. I think it will be very much a challenge because when you are the closer to closer to the top of the value chain, with every, with every transfer of product from hand to hand to hand down the value chain, a company like Dow loses, increasingly loses, loses insight, loses, loses control, if you will, into what ultimately happens with those products. So while we can, you know, engineer, innovate, think about risk mitigation on our end, there, I think there has to be a recognition that, that there is a degree of, of uncertainty and lack of control about product misuse and, um, and, and inadvertent sort of mistakes or mishandling as they move farther and farther away from our gate and into a, a downstream user's world. I think that's very fair, um, Carrie. And you know, I, I face the same challenge with some of our ranges as well. And I think part of it, part of what you're describing is is something we share as well. How do you design uh products, materials, usage to minimize that as far as is possible? And how do you try and build frameworks, build awareness? that help to further minimize it by supporting effective disposal and so on and so forth. And that, that, that's, part of how do you, uh, that's part of the approach for the downstream activity that we at Reckit are thinking through from both a chemistry point of view and a material science point of view in packaging and plastic. Um, but as you say, there are advantages that are created in other ways for other, if I think of a multiple capitals model, that, that, that having those products in people's hands makes a big difference to their lives in other ways. And these are 
Um, there is no simple solution. Well, I hate to say it. Um, I've got we've got time for one quick fire point. Uh, one, I, I, there's been a host of questions that we've not really been able to get to yet, but um, we'll see how, from a TNFG perspective, we can feed into that about whether there might be more support thereafter for scenario planning, as somebody's asked, and so on and so forth. Um, but um, I just wanted to uh, do one last question from you know to to, to you, Steve. Um, the LEAP framework and the guidance doesn't provide a point at which mitigations are applied when assessing an operation. And the question is, is that, you know, that's assumed that this is now then falls under the scenario analysis, uh, baseline versus mitigation versus advanced position with mitigation. So that to me suggests the scenario planning is a dynamic exercise. It's not a once then forget about it. It's ongoing. Is that how you would reflect it? Absolutely. I think, um, you know, I, I have always thought of scenario analyses as kind of living processes um, that get repeated. And in whatever time frame makes sense from the uh, perspective of an organization, um, the scenarios themselves evolve. Our assessments of where on the landscape, whether it be the firm's location on the axes or the direction in which the trends that we're trying to capture in those scenarios are sort of moving as both, as you said, David, market and non-market forces evolve, sometimes in sync with each other, sometimes not in sync with each other. Um, for me, the scenario analysis provides a common language on which firms can over time sort of not have to start from scratch in figuring out where you get the most bang for the buck in terms of those mitigation efforts that you want to actually engage in. I, I, I guess I'd want to end with that point from the perspective of someone looking at this kind of nature positive agenda um, from the outside. It feels like as with climate, every resource that a company spends on moving towards positive change needs to be spent efficiently. I think and, that's, oh, sorry, Steve. That's it. <laughs> I and, that was and I'll, end with, to, to, I'll end with to, that, to, David. It's like, you know, the, the goal is to actually make that resource allocation more efficient. And that is a dynamic process by its very nature. Absolutely. And it's also not just an individual process. One of the other questions was, how do you take account of, you know, when you're perhaps sourcing from a similar place, you're touching a shared um, ecosystem, how do you take account of other people's activities? Well, I think what it does is it encourage you to create collaboration, to create greater scale. And, and that helps to drive that activity much more um, clearly at scale and at pace for the future. Um, so I think, uh, unfortunately, we are right at the hour now. So thank you very much to, to Carrie and to Steve. We've had loads of questions that we've not been able to get to. Um, there will be more coming through from TNFD over the next few months, as you will see. Uh, do feed into the um, whole of the consultation exercise as you can. Um, I think you've heard a number of different comments today that sort of feed through to how do we work more collectively on it? Um, how do we collaborate on, on solutions that individually scenario planning helps to identify, but doesn't on its own solve at the pace and scale we have? Um, what I am seeing is certainly a wider external stakeholder engagement in this. And to somebody's question about um, how investor responses changed since, since TNCD, T, TNFD conversation started, I mean, Carrie is nodding if you can see her, and I can say the same from, from our point of view. Um, the world has, has woken up, perhaps too late, but the world has absolutely woken up to the challenges that um, nature faces. And, and TNFD is but one part of the solutions to that. But bringing those market actors together and, and, and trying to think collectively about solutions, I think, starts to accelerate momentum to solve some of those problems that the government policy um, conversation is already driving forward as well. So from that, if you will join me in thanking Steve and Carrie uh, for their fantastic contributions today, and please do join other TNFD sessions going forward and make your voice heard also in the consultation process. Uh, but for now, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to, to see and uh, get the questions from you all and have a great rest of your Monday, wherever you might be. Thank you very much.